We're in uh, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 18. I was talking to Denise about this. Typically, I would say that everything I do is a expositional verse-by-verse teaching, but really we're in a kind of a bit of a series here. It's a little bit more topical as we begin to unfold the, the last passage, the last verse in this little letter of 2 Peter. We started out by asking the question is, is what does it mean when he said in verse 18, but grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. This little simple verse is a, a summation of everything he said. It's an exhortation. And I, I recognize, as I said before, is it, it isn't a mystery of what it's saying here. As you look at this, we now know the divine expectation as well as the believer's responsibility. And on top of that, we're even told about where those two things are found. It's not like there's any mystery in this passage. It's a straightforward exhortation. And I started this a couple of weeks back just looking at it and noticing the fact that we, we know what we're expected to grow in. Grace and knowledge. We know where to find it. It is in the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We have those two things met in exactly where we should find them. It is a wonderful thing whenever you go somewhere and you're expecting to find what you need, know where to find it, know exactly it's exactly where it's supposed to be. I think it's why most people get in a rut when they go shopping for groceries or something. They choose one grocery store over another because if you've ever gone to a different grocery store, you can't find what you want. And if you're like me with such great patience in shopping, um, it's frustrating to go to the aisle where you think you're going to find whatever thing you needed. And, and, you know, we just the Thanksgiving thing's coming now around the corner and and we did our shopping on Thursday to go up to Costco, which I, I don't know what's going on with Costco, but it's, it was Thursday around noon when we got to Costco. Thursday around noon. Can somebody in Missoula please work? <laughs> Besides at Costco, can you please work? It was unbelievable the amount of people on Thursday at noon at Costco. The stimulus is alive, and I don't understand it. I, I just said the streets were packed. There was, the Grizz weren't even, you know, they weren't playing. I, there's the key. Wait to go shopping at Costco when the Grizz are playing a home game, and you can get in and out quickly. So I don't know anyway, but uh, it was frustrating because I, I, mean, I think I, we just kind of circled the place trying to find the stuff, what we needed to find, because you know how Costco, Costco does that deliberately. They have the shelves where things are supposed to be, and then just every so often, knowing that they want you to stay in that store longer because it's going to take you $300 to get out of the store. And so they just move the aisles here and there, and then you have to go find somebody to tell you where it's going to be. They do it deliberately. I'm certain of it. It's part of their marketing ploy. I love the fact here, though, that we don't have any guesswork in it. There's, there's nothing here... Uh, that, that is going to tell us uh, some mystery that we have to uncover, some puzzle that we have to figure out. We know everything we need to know about this. Furthermore, I think it's interesting to note that it's a definite change, and, and the word but grow, or those two words, tell us essentially that it isn't just about the things that we're to avoid in life. The Christian life can be such, and and, and boiled down to many people's faith is just about the things to avoid. He's already talked about that in, in verse 17 where he said, Beware lest you also fall from your own steadfastness. He's warned them about the pot potential that a believer might have uh, in, in indulging themselves or, or, or moving away from the simplicity they have in Christ. But I find wonderful to know about our Christian faith. It isn't just about things to avoid. As a matter of fact, it is the opposite of many of a football game where they say win, that, that, that defenses win championships. In this case, it's actually, uh, biblically speaking, it's an offense. We're to be advancing. We, the best way to not fall away is to be moving forward in your faith. It isn't something that you camp out uh, move away from, uh, isolate yourself in some little community or away from everything and avoid everything. 
the Christian life is really about an advancement to grow in your faith. I think it's marvelous it's that way. It, it is uh, uncommon that we see that. Uh, but it's why I think so many people fail in diets. Uh, you know, if everything is to avoidance of certain things, uh, then you go look at what you can eat. You go, well, you know, is it really worth it? You know, you, you, there's donuts. I mean, God caused there to be donuts. This can't be bad for me. And, you know, then the, you know, or you can have this, you know, sort of healthy thing that, you know, kale. I, there's, there's people that like kale. Um, um, I'm not one of them, but there's people that enjoy eating that stuff, or, you know, there's things that you can do that's healthy for you, but why, if they, they were really smart, the people that would manufacture, genetically alter, they would make kale taste like donuts, with the texture like it. It would be wisdom. Just, we'd be having them out here, and you'd just be having a box of them, and you'd say, it's good, it's kale, and then you could just have it. It's nice to know that a Christian faith is things that we enjoy going forward in our faith. And having said all of those things about it, I realize that even though that's here and it's so simple and so wonderful, it's all advancement, it's, it's the things that we know. But as I stop to just ponder and meditate on this verse, but grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ, I found my, myself realizing my, my biggest reason why I don't take this admonishment and I'm not actively pursuing the admonishment, it has to do with the fact that, is that my flesh doesn't want to. My flesh is never going to take this, this exhortation and say, yes, it has developed, as I said last week, a very uh, uh, advanced state of self-centered preservation. We, we recognize that self-preservation is something that God granted us. There is a natural inclination of all of us to, to have self-preservation. We do that not just physically, but even emotionally. We do it in so many different arenas where we, 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 we have a sense of which we're not going to do this because there's self-preservation. You know, it, it's, it's, it, we have self-preservation men. You know, if, if, if your wife comes to you with a new dress, you know that what I'm going to go with this, and she says, does it make me look fat? You have self-preservation. You don't... Yes, it does. That's not self-preservation. You're not going to say that. You know, baby, you, no matter what you wear, you look wonderful. And that there's, that's self-preservation. There's a natural, the guys aren't getting that, but the women are going, no, oh, the trick's out. Now I know. But the idea is that you would just come here and you begin to know the right things to say because emotionally, socially, you don't want to, there's self-preservation. You want to establish certain things. But I find in myself there is a, a self-centered preservation that isn't healthy. And that is that my flesh isn't going to naturally have an inclination to die to self-centeredness. And this part of this has caused me to realize that a verse like verse 18 is, throws me into just this intellectual agreement. It just says, yes, this is true. I know it to be true. Therefore, because I know it to be true, that's all I need to do with it. I know I need to grow in the grace and knowledge of Christ, and just because I've stated that's all I need to do. I intellectually agree with it, and it's automatic. And that's not the case. And so to do that, it cost me, and that's why we're in this section for the length of time we are, it, it naturally caused me to look at myself and ask the three questions that we started. First off, what does this mean? What does this exhortation really mean? Because that's what we, we, we can't apply something. We don't know what it means. We need to know what it means to comprehend what it means. And then where we're at today is how do I apply this exhortation after I know what it means? And then next week we'll move, how do I know that I'm applying it? And stated last week, just quickly going over this, is what things, uh, the question was, using the, the, uh, uh, the terminology grow immediately means that this he's talking about organic. He's not talking about a me mechanical application. It isn't a mathematical formula that we're looking at. This is an organic exhortation that started with the idea with growth. I think that the Holy Spirit led Peter naturally into the word grow in grace and knowledge and the organic terminology for a purpose because the application point would be much more easy for us to comprehend what he's trying to say. 
So I just began to asking myself four questions or, or four things about or came up with four things about what the truth about organic growth. And this is so that we don't make this mechanical. Because that's the problem with something like this. I'm growing in grace and therefore... And it's like the, the whole passage of Scripture in Ephesians 6 about put on the armor of God and people are mechanically trying to do something instead of recognizing that what they're doing is calling to remembrance what Christ has done for them. We make something mechanical out of it as if it's a works-based, legalistic thing and expect to have a, a natural results out of it. And we are frustrated that mechanical application of the truth of the Word of God isn't going to cause maturity to happen. What's going to happen is it's going to form us to be self-righteous and legalistic. Organic doesn't do that. Mechanical does. We begin to boast in the things that we're doing for God because we've done it mechanically. Organic doesn't allow you to do that. The seed doesn't say, look, how, look at all that I'm doing to grow. The seed just grows because of the natural things. And so I came up with four things based upon that phrase of growth, first off, it indicates that something is already alive. You cannot have something grow if it's not already alive, which again is a wonderful truth as it relates to organic maturity and growth in Christ because it is only because of what He's done for us. But He has first done for me that causes growth. It isn't something that I do to grow. It's something He has done and enables me to grow. We'll see even more of that today. Secondly, uh, because of that, and it dovetails right with this, life naturally leads to growth. The Christian life is never to be a stagnant place. Hence, again, this avoidance isn't the key. Uh, the Christian life is just like natural growth. We don't do anything naturally to grow physically. Uh, it just is a, a, it's a natural process. Life, if we're alive, is going to naturally lead to growth. These things should take place. I was fascinated about this uh, during uh, uh, Donna's stem cell transplant. And I, I, I learned more about uh, our cells and development. Uh, they took uh, from her sister these two big bags of, of uh, stem cells. It was fascinating how they did all this, and they spin it and do all this stuff and isolate all the natural stems. They, they actually gave her sister uh, natural growth hormones to do this, and then they spun it off and had these things. But when they gave her to these two like blood bags of, of stem cell, and then they told me there was only a thimble full of these stem cells that would actually make it into her bone marrow that would reproduce. And you think about all your bones, and it's all in your bone marrow, and, and a thimble full that was going to, and it, this natural growth process. And um, uh, it's fascinating to see how that growth would take place, even in a full grown adult, in, a, in essence, really, uh, that these stem cells, these. Uh, would take these little baby stem cells. They were. They, and they, the funny thing was the doctors even referred to them as, as infants because they just did crazy things. You never knew what they were going to do. And uh, they just would take off. And one of the problems was is that uh, really as an adult, she didn't have to worry about dieting that way any longer because the natural speed of the reproduction of these stem cells in about a month and a half was such that uh, she was losing weight at, at too rapid of a rate. That We had to feed her like crazy. They, all the energy being burned up by these are natural processes that our bodies has. And it was fascinating to see that life naturally leads to growth. It wasn't anything that she needed to do. She actually loved to lose the weight. Uh, and I was being screamed at by the nutritionist because she was losing weight. They wanted to feed her because they, the weight droppage was not in her best interest. And Anyway, fascinating stuff with all of that. Life naturally leads to growth. Third, organic, organic growth is a natural uh, process, but it's not instantaneous. And this is the thing that we often forget, that, that though organic growth, the relational maturity in our life spiritually is a process, it's not instantaneous. There's no skipping spots. 
This is why we need to allow ourselves to be in the place where maturity can happen. Because you can stagnate in such a place that you don't grow. We'll look again more at that in a moment when we answer how do we apply this truth. But you need to know that there is no skipping stages. We have developed a sophisticated mentality that simply says that because how old are you in Christ? And we immediately mention the chronological age when we first met Jesus to now. And so in my case, it would be almost 40 years or 40 years old in the Lord. Would to God it actually be 40 years old in the Lord maturity-wise? But it's not an issue just because you're 40 years old doesn't mean you're actually 40 years old in maturity. And that's, it's not, there's no skipping places. There's, it's a process that's not instantaneous. You need to be actively involved in this, a different dynamic than the physical it isn't mechanical, it's still organic, but you need to have the right soil conditions. You need to have the right uh, elements necessary for growth, and you can stagnate that by not having those things, and more importantly, by not applying it, which we'll see later on. And fourth, growth is, is specific, not random. P- Peter's mentioned specifically the areas where you should see growth. He mentioned them as grace and knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The first area of growth and maturity that the believer needs to have is a constant realization that it's everything coming from Him that we are not getting what we deserve. There should be an attitude of gratitude that's constant towards the Lord. We need to grow in grace. We need to understand that this isn't all praise and glory to Him alone. This is a sense of which uh, the Christian... I mean, again, we should wake up every day and say, that I, I don't deserve this. But not the way we often say it. We should be saying, I don't deserve this. I don't deserve this. I don't deserve this. I have never earned anything. It should be such an appreciation. That's the area he's talking about, grace. The Christian life is one where it's constant in thanksgiving. Look at me. Look at what I have. I don't deserve this. Instead of, I'm going through all this, I don't deserve this, it's, Man, look at my life. Look as a believer, a constant sense of everything that God has poured out so lavished upon us, uh, the goodness of God. He is not good only when he meets our expectations. He's never not good. And every moment of the day we have been blessed. And then where do we find maturity? Where is it? In the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. It's in a continual growth towards, but notice the specifics, not just in knowledge. It's specific knowledge in our Lord and Savior. Interesting. Lordship is a key part of that. We're not just growing in the knowledge of Jesus as my Savior. We're submitting our life to under the Lordship of Him. We're growing in the fact that He is in control, I am not. Matter of fact, I love the order of it. The Lord and Savior. Savior is only second, is secondary because if He's not your Lord, He's not your Savior. There's a continual part of our maturity needs to be understanding that He is in control. He has every right to my life. Every one of us has a shirt that says property of Jesus. It isn't ours. My life is, doesn't belong to me. I was a slave and He has set me free. It is His life. My life belongs to Him. And so with that, we can now go into the application. In the Christian church, looking at historically, let me do a little historical background. The Christian church has, uh, and I'm looking specifically at the Christian church, but the Christian church has tried to answer the question of how do I apply this exhortation in my life now based upon uh, two uh, diametrically opposed uh, points of view. The first point of view is what I've already su- suggested earlier, and that's the attempt to, for us to make this mechanical. It's come to the conclusion that it is impossible for a person to grow and mature in the Christian faith while living in this world system. I understand the, the concept of this. I, I do get the fact that living in a world system that's tainted by Satan makes it difficult for us to grow in grace. And so this uh, church position, the church position, comes into this idea of saying that the only way that we can actually grow in grace is to separate ourselves from the world. And I, again, 
uh, acknowledge the fact that there is some logical thought process into that. It is created a, 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 a mindset of how to do that. One is to, uh, to create communities by which they separate uh, themselves from the world system and then, and then navigate to the congregations, if you will, or locations to say that's the best way that you can now grow in grace. Stay in your community. Don't deviate from your community. Um, and then it's also done by recognizing that there's a special class of people uh, that can only grow in grace. And uh, I'll give you two examples of how this is played out, and then I'll conclude with this way that I don't agree with, of how we do it even as Christians today. But the, the idea is this. The, the first system I saw in place in Chihuahua, Mexico, is with a group, and I don't, if you have the background here, I don't mean to be uh, offensive to anybody, but this was, they were Mennonite. Uh, we have Hutterites here in Montana. The mentality is that we can just separate ourselves to a, co a community, a town, a, a farming community. And then we regulate all of that into uh, its own little atmosphere. And that this is how we can only grow in grace. Then we can maintain by keeping the world out of the system. And now we, we've seen of Amish. We, there's multiple groups that have employed this, techni this technique to growing in grace. They keep the world out. Some of it's extreme. You know, no motorized this and know this and know that. And it, it looks like you've gone back 300 years in time if you go to a community like But the mindset was this. The mindset was actually done before all the technological advancements. The mindset was, look, if we can keep the world system out, we'll have the possibility of growing in grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's the world system that's the problem. It's the external problem, not the internal problem. Now, the fascinating thing, at least with the group of Mennonites we were with in Mexico, was they had started this journey out hundreds, 600, 700 years ago. They were in, they were in, uh, in, in Germany, where they started this, this Mennonite group, started at, and they had this, uh, in Germany, they said, look, we, we, just, we just want to exist in our little community of Mennonites here, and uh, as long as you don't... Uh, interfere with our education system and you don't force us to be in your military, we'll just coexist. Uh, we'll have a, we'll just, just leave us alone, we'll leave you alone. And we'll have this. Well, Germany ab abided by that for a period of time and then they said, no, you have to join the military and you can't have uh, religious schools anymore. And then they left and they, they went to Russia. And uh, that didn't go very well. Uh, because the Russia said, yeah, we'll take you guys. And then Ru they went to Russia, and they had their little community, and Russia said, no, you've got to join the military, and you can't have state-run schools anymore. Boom, gone. Guess where they went? Canada. It was wonderful in Canada for a long, long, long time. And, uh, and, and then about 75 uh, years ago, uh, Canada said, no, if you're going to be here, you can't have your own little schools any longer and you have to join the military. And so they sent a group of about a dozen elders down to Mexico. And they kind of traveled around Mexico for a while, and they couldn't find any place in Mexico that would work with their agri agricultural needs but this little area outside of Chihuahua, Mexico. And they, they, they came there, they saw it, they said, hey, we could grow, this will work. And uh, you gotta understand, these people, they don't look like Mexicans. They look, they're Caucasian in nature. They speak uh, this old style of German uh, and, uh, and Spanish. And then they, but they all moved there. But what happened is they went to the president of the president of Mexico at the time and said, look, could you just guarantee us that we could uh, have our own little schools and uh, not join the military? And they signed off. They got a document. And they have kept that document. But the problem was is that... Uh, even though they had the little communities and, they, and, and, and did well with their farming, uh, we were talking to them. We went to the little thing that they had there to see all this. 
They, by, the, by the 1980s, late 1980s, early 1990s, they had excommunicated more people uh, from the group than they had in the group. And so even though they, they actually indirectly discovered the problem, the problem is not external, it's internal. And uh, they thought they could rid it. And they were actually communicating people because, because this right here, this would, keep, this would kick me out of the Mennonite because you're seeing my arm. And, uh, and the guy, guy was, had a field, and he, uh, instead of using horse-drawn carriage, he got a lawnmower, and they kicked him out. And, uh, I mean, it was this kind of stuff going on all over the place. It was, it was, it was sad, but somewhat humorous. Uh, because the group that we're talking about it was showing us. That is one way, one extremism of how the Christian church has tried to mandate uh, having to uh, grow in grace while living in a world that isn't. Isolated communities. Now, they're not the only ones that have done that. I've mentioned there's multiple groups, both on the evangelical side as well as the Roman Catholic side. The Roman Catholic side has done what? Well, they have had areas where they do the same thing, uh, they're actually a little more sophisticated because, first off, there are far more many Roman Catholics than there would be, say, Mennonites. And so what the Roman Catholic uh, did is recognize, well, first off, if we ask everybody to, to go to, uh, um, not, what am I thinking, uh, monasteries, oh, that would, <laughs> I mean, a lot of people in a monastery. So they, they developed a special class of people. Uh, and uh, the only special class of people would be those that would be expected to live this way. They separated them from the world. They, they said that marriage, um, no, the priest, priestly class, they had created church and laity. And then they had these rules in monasteries. And, and, that, and that was how the Roman Catholics began to handle this, this equation of how do we handle, how do we grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ, but yet uh, be in a world system? Well, because of sheer numbers, I, if you were Roman Catholic, you, uh, you, you could either join a monastery, and that would make you a special class of people, and then you would have to, you could grow in the grace. The rest of you guys, if you were Roman Catholic, like they just kind of gave up on you. And they invented things like you have to do a few thousand years in purgatory and a few things like that to get out. It, they had invented whole new ways. But it was all based upon the same principle of how do we grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ when we're living in a world system that's, that's just absolutely opposed to it. And that's how they came up with it. These are just philosophical uh, equations to answer the question. The second view, the one I hold, is that it's not a mechanical exhortation. And how do we grow in grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ while in a world that is diametrically opposed to it? It's an organic position, not a mechanical position. And it's something, again, is not, not, it's not me having to, to separate from the world system. We, we are to be uh, in the world, but not of the world. And that the idea, the point of view, the biblical point of view that I see is, is that God has given us everything necessary to grow spiritually the moment we became a believer in Christ. Separating myself from the world system isn't the answer. And it very well may, may make the problem worse. It doesn't fix anything. I don't need to be a special external place. Uh, instead, this special external place is really my own heart. And every believer has the same possibility to be growing in the, in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, Peter already addressed this uh, in his first uh, letter. And, uh, and, and again, uh, Paul wrote of it in Ephesians 3, 17 and 19, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width, the length, the depth, and the height, to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Nowhere does Paul say, Man, if you leave this and go to over here, go to Canada, go to wherever, go to Mexico. He doesn't say any location. He never mentions that. As a matter of fact, the author of Hebrews chapter 10, verse 16, quoting the prophetic promise of Jeremiah 31, 33, said it this way. This is the covenant that I will make with them after these days says the Lord, I will put my laws in their hearts and in their minds, and I'll write them. That's where I'll put them. 
It's here. I'll do the work. Those are the things that are necessary, all done by, by, by the Lord, the things that He's already done. These, these aspects of growth are natural, organic, part of where we are. We don't need to be in a special location. But with that said, it is interesting to note that with the organic point of view, there are still certain things that are absolutely essential for growth. And I'm, again, just thinking about plant life for a second. And you can, you can Google this if you want. You can, but what are the essential things for a plant to grow? Again, he's the one that's brought up this terminology grow. I, I wanted to apply this in my life. What are the things necessary, absolutely essential for growth and organic plant development as well as human life? But these things are absolutely essential for growth. The first, obviously, would be sunlight. I mean, there's no doubt of that. Without the sun, we need the sunlight. You need food. Got to have food. You can't grow without food. You need to have water. Can't grow without water. And you need air. There's essentially four uh, specific things necessary for organic growth. It seems to me that Peter's, Peter's use of this word is presupposing that we would come to those conclusions and that these things are already provided for us to grow. And therefore, the things that necessitate our growth is just recognizing that God has provided the things necessary for growth and to make certain we're in a place to where we have sunlight where we have food, where we have water, and we have air. So if we look at those sayings, and now is there any way that we can begin to cross-reference that to anything spiritual? And uh, I, I'm going to apologize. This, these are mine. You may come up with other ways of looking at them, but I think the sunlight is pretty obvious for me. Uh, I think uh, the sunlight being the most essential is something he's already said that were to grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, I would say the sun, S-U-N, equals the sun, S-O-N. That's the way I looked at it. You can disagree with me. One of us would be wrong. But uh, we can look at it that way and just say that our Lord has given us everything. The most n thing that, that absolutely is essential is the sunlight. We have the sun. He who has the sun has life. He who does not have the sun does not have life. The sun is the most essential. And by the way, it's by the Son, if you will, since all things are created uh, by Him and for Him, and through all things exist, as Colossians tells us. If I just look at it that way, then guess who, in essence, has created the food, the water, and the air? The Son. And I know that's not in a true sense. Our Son didn't necessarily create our, you know, the yellow ball in the sky, didn't create the other things. But, be that as it may, just... Follow along with me. The, the other elements would be impossible without a relationship with Jesus Christ. Something's already presupposed. If you do not have Jesus Christ, then you are not even alive. And even though you have the sun and you have the water and you have the food and you have the air, if you don't have the Son of God in your life, you are not going to grow. Again, noted the fact that you can have a rock out here that has access to water, sun, it has soil, it has the atmosphere, but it doesn't grow. It, it doesn't do anything. It just sits there. It never grows one iota, which says it's not alive. But if you have any type of seed out here, even in Montana, it has a shorter growing cycle, you have those things out here, it will naturally go because they're alive. Now, having said that the sun equals the sun, and then uh, that he's the absolutely most essential thing in our growth is that we are born again. We have life. We were once dead, but now we're alive. We have Christ. What does the food represent? Well, again, I don't think it's a stretch to look at this. And again, you could disagree. But Peter's already mentioned this in 1 Peter 2.2 2, in his first letter. He says, as newborn babes... Desire the pure milk of the word, 
that you may grow thereby. I would say the food represents the Word of God. I mean, it's just again looking at the necessity of what elements that Christ has provided for me by which I need to make certain. In other words, if I, if I am going to apply this principle of maturity and growth and the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ, if I am going to understand and appreciate more what God has done for me, if I'm going to go and have more knowledge about Him being my Lord and Savior, where, what is I need to have that? Well, of course, you need to be born again, number one. Number two, you need to be in the Word of God. And this this is something we can begin to detect if I'm going to apply this principle. I need to be in the Word. I need to have a diet that is spiritually centered upon the Word of God. A Christian that does not have a consistent diet upon the Word of God will become unhealthy. They cannot grow because they're not in the elements of having the right food. It's interesting that the prophet Amos said that. He said there would be a famine land, not of bread and water, but of the Word of God. Uh, just because they have access to the Word of God does not make necessarily... You can have a, a cupboard full of food and not eat it and still starve to death. And again, that takes uh, an application not just by what you're hearing on the pulpit, but what you're doing in your self-feeding in your own life. Are you in the Word of God? And furthermore, I would say that you can have a steady diet where you're getting the Word of God on a Sunday or Wednesday or, or whatever basis you're getting it, but not applying it, hence what I've already said here. The application, knowing something intellectually, does not necessarily mean automatically that you're going to be eating on it. I know that certain things I should be eating are better for me. I made the mistake of that yesterday. We were way up in Big Fork and and I went to a great little breakfast place up there. Uh, phenomenal. I did pretty good. I had huevos rancheros. It was good. It was incredible. But, the, but there was another thing winking at me on the menu item that, I, that didn't benefit me. It was a, a cinnamon cake. It was an apple cinnamon cake, to be quite frank. And uh, I should not have eaten it. Uh, I grew, um, not the way I should have, but uh, y you can know the right things and the wrong things, but you cannot partake of them in the right way. And this is why I, I'm such a, s a staunch uh, believer that, that the Bible was written the way we have it and should be devoured the way it is given to us. It's line upon line, precept upon precept, uh, uh, verse upon verse, book by book. It needs to be studied that way. I'm not a big fan, although I'm kind of doing it now, of topical teaching. I think it's not that it's not true that the, the, the diet-wise, that people do not uh, necessarily know the continuity of the Scripture. They don't see the connectivity of the Scripture. They don't get the, you can, the, the teacher can there, therefore pick and choose different aspects or subject matters that they want. I'm not a big fan of topical teaching. And again, doesn't mean that the, the teacher is not teaching truth. It just means that the, the, the person hearing it as a regular diet isn't getting the connectivity. They don't know what the book of Galatians is about. They have no idea, most of them, who even wrote it. They have no connectivity to it. They're not spending time to investigate and chewing on it and meditating and putting it in their life. And so I think it's imperative that we find uh, a church uh, that we grow. Uh, you know, the people that, that are in their Bibles on a regular basis. An immature faith usually indicates somebody that's not into the Word. They may intellectually quote it, but they're not into the Word. They're not seeking to apply the truths of the Word of God. You can relatively see that by spending somebody, even if they go to church consistently, you can see immaturity in their life but they're not applying the Word of God on a consistent basis. And I also say that the continued, consistent attendance. This is becoming a greater, greater problem because of COVID and things like that. But consistent attendance where people will hold you accountable. It's why people prefer larger churches, by the way. Lack of accountability. Nobody's going to hold me accountable. Smaller churches, probably not going to get away with as much. Uh, we have a consistent attendance. And, and, and is there, you know, somebody growing in that? No other way to be spiritually healthy than a consistency with the Word of God. And so 
Uh, you need to feed. Make sure you're feeding on the Word of God. Secondly, water. Now this is, again, these are my way of explaining this. You can come with different. I looked at water, and, and the second essential thing necessary for growth and grace and knowledge, I would have to say, would be communication. I called it prayer, but communication. That's where water of the, water of the Word of God has reminds ourselves of the truths of that we've just read, talking them into our life, communicating with God on a consistent basis. It must not be just one-sided, not just telling God what to do. Oftentimes, I think we need to redefine the term of what prayer is. Prayer is communication. In this case, it's communication with our, with our Heavenly Father. And if we're the only one communicating, it tells us one of us isn't listening. You can figure out who. Us. We're too busy talking. I think prayer is... Is to be effective a prayer life isn't me just telling God what He, but what I want Him to do, when I want Him to do it, the way I want Him to do it. Effective prayer communication is me sitting at His feet, listening to Him, learning to hear from God is a key thing. It's what we do at our staff meetings uh, four times a week. I want to hear what God showed them in the last 24 hours. I want to see if they're listening, recognizing things. It also involves waiting, doesn't it? I think that's the hardest part of communication with any individual, is waiting. <laughs> yes, no, I handle those pretty well. Wait, not so well. And I have a problem with it. I have an impatient spirit. Learning to wait on God and not busy ourselves with the things of this world and this life. I think every Christian would benefit what we children, the parents often do with their children. That's it, Junior. Knock it off or there's going to be a timeout. I, I think we need timeouts. I think it's a healthy thing when God says it's time out time, Dale. Jesus gave his disciples timeouts. Really? Yeah, he did. Come away with me. Time out. You've been really busy the last time. A lot of things going on, guys. Time out. Let's go. Timeouts are very important. I think we need to have at least 30 minutes a day where we can be still before God. I recommend that. I know we have busy lives. I know that we're constantly, especially if you're raising children or grand, you're with your grandkids, you have a busy life. You need to get a minimum of 30 minutes a day. Now, you can do that with your spouse if you want, as long as you can both be quiet a bit. But I think it's important that you have 30 minutes a day. Minimum. Mine anymore, it's hours. I try to have a couple hours every day. I need just to just be still. So during that time where I'm not saying a word, just listening to music or something that he's speaking to me and talking to me about me, I need to have a time. And again, I'm not telling him what I want. He's telling me who he is. And often, oftentimes, once he tells me who he is, I don't have anything to say. I realize that most of the stuff I'm going to ask has already been answered because of who he is. And that's what I needed to do. Then you fourth, you have air. And that, that one's a little more difficult for me to come up. I I wrestled with this of what is the air? We need to have an atmosphere for things to grow. If you don't have air, it won't grow. If you choke off any plant and it doesn't have air or any living thing has no air, eventually what will happen to it? It'll die. It needs to have air. Yes, it needs water. That's simple. Yes, it needs uh, it needs the food. And, and we know it all comes from the source of the Son of God, but what does air represent? And the first thing, of course, I came up with was well, that was the Holy Spirit. And when those were, you know, that whole thing. And I, well, that's already kind of covered. And so uh, I looked at air a little differently. And again, you may disagree with this, but I think the air is just for the believer's faith and, and the work and promise of God. It's trusting Him. Faith is that thing that's invisible like air, isn't it? You can't really see it. It's not faith. Faith isn't just a, it's not the, you know, it's not some Star Wars technique. Faith is something that's invisible in a sense, but really it's everything. It's not, it's not faith in our faith. It's the object of our faith. But we, we need to have that area that takes all those elements and then just trusts in Him alone. Trusting in his word and that he knows what is best for us, his character, his nature. 
faith isn't in our way being best or that God will work things out. It's really just trusting in Him that He knows what is best for us. That He will always answer according to His character and His nature because He loves us. We need to grow in this air because it is the only way that we can be consistent in the above. Just learning to rest upon Him. And I think uh, those are the areas that I'd say, for me, were the essentials of growth. And that brought me to the final thing that we'll close on today and then we'll have food. And that is, uh, what are the things necessary with those elements for us to, uh, to uh, apply those truths? Noting what they are now, the Word of God, prayer, faith. We have the Son of Jesus. We now know the necessary elements, but is there anything the plant can do, us, the individual can do, to, to essentially grow? I came up with three things. Maybe you would come up with less or different ones, but here's the three things. Number one, we will need to avoid the things that keep us from the essential elements. I would say diet. If we're going to have uh, if water is going to be effective, we need to make sure that we have water, not Kool-Aid or, or soda pop. Follow me? I mean, we need to have, avoid the things that would keep us from the water. Uh, we need to have food. If we're going to have the soil, the Word of God, we need to avoid the things that are junk food. Diet, if you will, is the way I looked at it. We need to, because, you know, that's the one that dangerous false teaching is it keeps us from the real food. That's the problem. It fills our bellies with other things, and we had no appetite for the right things. So that's what I said. I just diet, and the second one is exercise. I, I know these are pretty basic, but we'll need to exercise the right things as well. We need to exercise. And again, the Christian life isn't about avoidance. About, it's about practicing the right things. You ask anybody, any training for athletes, or anything out there, uh, you, you've got to have the right diet, you can have the right exercise. They've got to be, uh, you've got to be having habits that you are working to enable your health to become strong. And if you don't have exercise, the right, just the right diet alone won't help you. Um, you've got to exercise. It's, you, but I, I would say this, if you don't have the, uh, the right diet, exercise alone will help you. They kind of go hand in hand. You've got to have the right diet with the right exercise. And there's only one last thing that I came up with, and, and I found this to be very true in my own life over the last few years. You'll need to learn to rest. If you do not have, you can have the right diet, you can have the exercise, but if you are not getting proper rest or proper sleep, I mean, that's why some people do the CPAP machine. They're not sleeping well. You can eat right and exercise regularly, but if you are not getting it, your body is going to run down. You're not going to grow if you don't get the right amount of rest. For me, this is the one that I know I, I was, I know I didn't eat right either and I didn't exercise well, but this is the one that was the hardest for me. And it wasn't until my wife got sick and died that I didn't, I didn't realize how bad I was at resting. I just wasn't resting. Now, resting isn't just a physical sense, but it's learning to rest in Him, trust Him. I'd say in the last three years of my life, I probably grew more at resting in Christ than I have in any other area of my life. I needed to just uh, learn to wait upon Him and rest and, and see that He had that he, he had me in his loving arms in the midst of horrible situations. And he forced me there, by the way. I, I would not have come to rest any other way. I was driven to rest. I had no choice. I, and just a busy guy didn't want to rest. He said, no, you're, you're going to rest now. I'd say these are the big three things that we're going to have in our lives if we're going to maintain applying this. Hopefully, you got all that down. I, I pray you did because I think... And now we know what it means. Now we know how to apply it. Next week we'll see you get a, get a way of testing whether you get to do it, whether you're actually doing these things. But uh, I found this uh, personally, uh, this study so far, to have been one of the more convicting ones I've given. For you guys maybe, second service. But me, this, this has been brutal. 
So let's pray for the food we're going to partake of and, and, uh, and this time we've had. Father, we just thank you for your word. And Lord, I thank you for the time we've had this, this morning. And um, Lord, I'm so glad that you, you've, at least for me, allowed me to look at this in the way you have. You know my propensity, Lord, to uh, escape uh, uh, the, the application of something so simple as this, just with the, uh, the false intellectual idea that just knowing it equals doing it. And in case, Lord, you have reminded me of my self-centered preservation, but Lord, I want to apply these truths. I want to make certain that I am taking the elements that you have provided for me and and doing the things uh, necessary of eating the right things and exercising and resting so that you can have me grow as you'd want me to in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, that I would be being uh, changed from degree by degree, from glory to glory, all by your work as I keep myself from those elements of, of the food of the Word of God and, and fellowship and communion a prayer and and then just trusting you and staying close to you oh lord i thank you for all those things bless this food as we're going to partake as well we ask in jesus name amen